don't know if I'm gonna be able to face this. I can't believe it's here already. We're gonna have to go through this today. I think a memorial service is a wonderful idea. Just a remembrance of Nicole with a lot of friends. We talked about it a long time ago. You know, what would happen if one of us died? She wanted it this way. You know, I think it's a, a good idea that you let Adam spend the day with Mrs. Goodman. He probably wouldn't know what to make of all of this. That was the only way to handle it. He's got enough adjustments to make without worrying about other people's emotions. You know, Miles, you really haven't been eating right. I mean, you skipped breakfast again. Oh, I'm not very hungry. What about coffee? Would you like some more before we go? No, thanks. You know, Oscar said that somebody stopped by here last night to uh, see me. Who was it? Oh, last night. It was, uh, it was just a friend who came by to offer condolences to you. Oh. Well, it's about that time. You ready? Miles. Oh, Miles, we're going to make it through this. We'll do it together. Come on. Come on. Edge of Night is brought to you by squeezably soft shaman bathroom tissue and by new enriched Prell. New Prell puts the ooh in shampoo. Dear friends, Jody and I would like to welcome you and thank you for sharing this day with us. We, we want to make it very clear this isn't a funeral. It's just a time to remember a, a wife, a sister, a friend to recall the joys that she brought to all of us and the meaningful ways that she touched all of our lives. We thought this would be the best way to pay tribute to her and we certainly think that she would prefer this than expressions of mourning. So we don't invite your grief today. We just all want to remember the pleasures of her company. For those of you who want to express their remembrances of Nicole, we. We hope that you will feel free to share them with us. Jody? Um, my sister Nicole took me in, I guess, about three years ago when I first came to Monticello. And she didn't know anything about me, except maybe that I wasn't as tough as I seemed, and that I needed to be loved. Um, one of her very special qualities was um, was her ability to see things, you know, see the other side of the story, see it from the other guy's side, and even if she didn't agree with it. And in fact, um, I was talking about a friend of mine with her the other day, a person um, whom she didn't really approve of. Very lucky. Why? To have someone who cares about him as much as you do? Well, I do, but... But what? I'm not ready to move in with him. I want to take it slow. I want our relationship to grow naturally. And what I was hoping for was that you and Miles would trust me enough to know that I'm not going to do anything stupid. <laughs> And I know that Miles and Preacher don't get along. Oh, no, that is an understatement. And I know that Preacher doesn't exactly fit in. But right now I need him. And I need for you to accept him. And if we do, you won't move out? I'm sorry if that sounds like an ultimatum. Oh, Jody. You are a Travis through and through. We've been through a lot together, haven't we? And through it all, we have remained sisters and friends. 
And what are friends for if they can't help each other? You'll try? <laughs> I'll try. What about Miles? Oh, well, we'll both have to work on him. I'm glad that she knew it before she left. Geraldine, you had something to share? Yes, Miles. Of her many admirable qualities, I suppose, most of all, I'll remember Nicole's cool courage in the face of adversity. There was no nonsense about her. She was practical to the core. At a time when she was living under the threat of indictment. She saved me the unhappy task of having to ask for her resignation from WMON. I found her in her office one day, cleaning out her desk. Can't imagine what the studio will be like without you. Well, it would be impossible for me to continue working here. It's better that I resign now before you have all the viewers beating down the doors and before, before all the advertisers cancel all their commercials. I know, I know. I understand that. It would be a great hardship on everyone, from you right down to the janitor, to say nothing of all the fights you would have with Skyler. I suppose I can't argue with that from a strictly business standpoint. What can I say? Nothing. But I can say thank you. For everything. Nicole was simply trying to soften my distress. And she did it with her usual cheerfulness and grace. Derek, you say something. Sure. Nicole Cavanaugh knew almost everything there was to know about compassion. I remember, in a very vivid memory, the time when I was in pain, I just suffered the loss of my wife, Jinx, and Nicole came to see me. She just put out her hand and she said, I'm, I'm here. What can I do? And I said, well, just talk to me. Just keep talking. Talk to you all night, you thought. So, what happened? special day to day for her. She was very anxious about fixing her first home cooked meal for me. She uh, planned all of this, all the menu and the flowers and the candles. And oh, Derek. It meant a lot to her to, to give something to me like this finally. She was interrupted. And the bags of groceries are still in the kitchen. And the cookbook is still just laying there. When I came home, she was laying there. God, I knew right away. I knew right away as soon as I came in there was something wrong. die alone. Oh, Derek. Derek, please, listen to me. Jinx was a very brave and a very beautiful woman. And she loved you so much. She loved you with all her heart. And you did something so wonderful in return for that love. You loved her back and you made her time here so very special. And there is nothing on this earth that can ever take that away from you.
the same thing can be said for Nicole, that we'll never be without her, never. Gavin? Generosity. Um, that's what I remember most about Nicole, a generosity of spirit. I was broke, I remember. For some time, I was floundering around, trying to find the right job, a uh, place in life, uh, some kind of direction. I was beginning to feel like an orphan in the storm. Then Nicole laughed at my self-pity and opened her heart and said, come on, Gavin, share what we have. Share our home and our family. And I did, and she treated me like a kid brother. She made me feel like I belonged somewhere. It was no big deal to her, but it was to me. She gave me something fine and rare, and I'll always carry it with me. privileged to be able to call Nicole my friend. Quite simply, I loved her. But more than that, I liked her. For a long period of time, uh, especially these last years, uh, we saw very little of each other. But then, when we did, well, it was as though we had been interrupted for a very brief span of time. We um, both cherished the feeling of the continuity of our affection. I really can't begin to try to single out any one particular memory of Nicole, because there's so many, and so varied. But I, I did want to say that uh, I agree with Miles and Jody. This isn't a time to grieve for her. It's a time to celebrate her life. Well, now, it's funny. I didn't think I'd be able to get through this time of memory. But uh, I see with your help I have. I also remember all the things you've mentioned about Nicole. I remember her generosity and her grace and her warmth, and her loyalty. But there's some other things I remember, too. I remember her sense of fun and her laughter. We laughed a lot. We laughed a lot. She could always turn a minor tragedy in, into a high comedy. She was a formidable adversary in an argument because I, I'd be off on one of my tirades and all of a sudden she'd say something so outrageously funny I just would dissolve into laughter and I'd have to throw up my hands in defeat. So she almost always came out the winner. She was always the winner. Again, I want to thank you all for coming today and sharing your remembrances of Nicole. She had a favorite quote by some anonymous poet. I don't know who it is. She wrote it to me in a letter once. And I'll leave you with the thought that it holds. Say not good night, but in some brighter place, bid me good morning. Mrs. Saxon, I'm, I'm really very sorry about Nicole. It's kind of you to express it. If there's anything at all that I could do to help, uh, around the station, I mean. <clears throat> yes, well, I've been giving that a good deal of thought today, Peter. As difficult as it is, I have to be a pragmatist. I'm facing a very difficult decision. Well, I, I would imagine that you'd, you'd want to replace her. On the contrary. As a woman commentator, she'll be irreplaceable. So I won't even try. Well, of course. Uh, I understand how you feel. That being the case, I will want you to continue to anchor the five o'clock news alone. I see. Now, before you give me a definite answer, let me tell you that I will understand perfectly if you refuse. 
Why would I do that? As unpleasant as it is to remind you. You might have been the target for the killer. So, if you have even a shred of anxiety, I wouldn't blame you. Not at all. I'll be happy to fill the post as long as you need me. Believe me, there is nothing that would frighten me away from this job. You were great today. So are you. I thought the service was beautiful. Just full of love for Nicole. Yes, it was. Good thoughts, fond memories. The way it should be. I was just wondering something. Now that I've lost Nicole, am I going to lose you too? Miles, where did you ever get an idea like that? For you, I guess. Miles, this isn't the time. Yeah, I guess you're right. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. You're not putting me on the spot. I just wish. I wish that you weren't so controlled. Why don't you... Why don't you do something? Why don't you rant? Why don't you rave? Why don't you cry? Why don't you beat your head against a wall? Why don't you give in to your grief? I can't, Julie. I don't know why. I just can't. Mrs. Saxon. Could I see you for a moment? I, I need your advice. Why, of course, Dan. I hate to bother you, especially at a time like this. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Usually, I'm the one who comes to you with problems. What is it? Well, I really don't know how to say this, but I have to. I, I'm losing sleep over it. Then you'd better tell me without delay. Well, see, it's like this. That night, you and I were working late, and, and Nicole came by. You remember? I'm not likely to forget it. Well, I saw something. I, I didn't tell the police about it. I guess I should have. But I don't want to cause trouble for anybody. Besides, it's probably nothing anyway. Why don't you let me be the judge of that? Well, I thought you two were the only ones in the building. Considering what happened, obviously you were wrong. That's just it. There was someone else in the building, and and I know who. Yes. Well, it was Peter Nevins. I know, because his car was still in the lot when I went to mine. Are you sure it was Peter's car? Absolutely. I'd know it anywhere. I didn't think anything about it at the time. Not until the police were questioning everybody. But then, Peter never said a word about being there. Why do you suppose that was, Mrs. Saxon? I'd like to come by the studio tomorrow for the broadcast, kind of cheer you on. Oh, I'd now, love it if I, you could. I don't want to do it if it's going to throw you off. No. So just... no, it would be wonderful. It would help me knowing you were there. Sure. Thanks. I'm your biggest fan, you know. <laughs> I love you. Despite that horrible, horrible dream you had last night, I'll never leave you. You promise? With all my heart. But you did leave me. You lied to me.
This is David Hartman. Tomorrow on Good Morning America, astronaut Sally Ride previews the space shuttle launch. Also, Jane Fonda and Donna Summer. Next week, Menudo and Ronald Reagan Jr. on Good Morning America. Tonight, Henry hits the ceiling when he sees Sarah's centerfold photo in a men's magazine on Too Close for Comfort, followed by It Takes Two.